Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Fiona Flintan, and I am a senior scientist at ILRI, the International Livestock Research Institute. Uh, we've got a fabulous session here for you today. Really, really interesting. Um, it focuses on, uh, on One Health and um, how we really need to start thinking about One Health as an approach uh, within landscapes and within the landscape approach. So um, I'm going to briefly run through the agenda. Um, we, we will start off the session with uh, a few questions to get your, to get your, uh, your thinking going and, um, and to see what your understanding is at the moment. Um, and then we're gonna have a, a cozy fireside chat with Dennis Carroll, who is the director of the Global Vrome Project. Um, then we will hear from three case studies um, from the field, um, giving experiences of how One Health has been integrated to different degrees within a landscape level approach. This will be then followed by a, pan, pan, a policy panel discussion um, and questions, um, and then we will wrap up and conclude. So that's what we've got in store for you today. Um, it's definitely gonna be more interesting than it possibly sounds. Um, we want to hear from you throughout the session. I hope you've all registered for WOVA. Um, so within that, you will be able to type in your questions um, on the session. Um, and to answer our questions, which will be coming up in a minute, uh, please use the Menti app or type in menti.com in your browser. So our first question, um, to get you going this morning um, on Menti is, so how do you grade your understanding of One Health? So it seems that the, the majority have, have heard of the concept, at least. Um, some don't really understand it, um, but there's a fair amount of people that, that know the concept um, and have and a small amount of people who have worked on it. Um, so Michael, do you think we should move on to the next question? Okay, so our second question for you today, uh, at the start of this, we're gonna ask you some questions at the end as well. Um, how important do you think it is to in integrate One Health with the landscape approach?
So I, I understand we've got about 565 people actually logged in. So I hope some more are going to uh, going to answer the questions. Perhaps it gets, takes people a bit of time to uh, get logged on to Menti and get used to using it. Okay, Michael, do you think we should move on? So last question for you. Uh, what burning questions do you have in regards to integrating animal, human and environmental health? So you, if you could just put very short questions in there. And we hope that we'll be able to address them throughout the session. And I'm being told that we're, we've got some great uh, geographic coverage across the session. We've got people from Brazil, Ghana, Indonesia, Venezuela, Nigeria, Nepal, Africa. For sure, we've got Kenya, Ethiopia. Europe, Australia. So I think we're gonna have a really interesting interactive session together. So I'll give you, I'll give you another minute to, to put in some questions there because it's really helpful for us as well to know, you know what, what you would like to know from us. And I, I hope that we'll be able to to cover some of these. And I can see already from some of the questions that, yeah, you're gonna, I think you're gonna come out with a good understanding or better understanding after this session. And I think a special word goes to the person from Michigan, USA where I'm told it's 3 a.m. in the morning now. So thanks for joining the session. Okay, 30 seconds more perhaps. Get those questions in. And I, I hope our, um, our panelists and, uh, and uh, discussants uh, are also looking at these questions and let's see if we can um, help to address some of these in the, in the discussions. Great, well, I think we can keep that going. Um, and Michael, I think we're okay to move on, yeah? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so um, for our first presentation today, we're going to show you a pre-recorded interview um, that I did with um, Dr. Dennis Carroll, um, who is the, he heads the Global Barome Project. Um, because of the time difference, uh, Dr. Dennis wasn't able to join us, but um, we had a, a great um, chat um, a couple of days ago. So we're going to show you a recording of this. So um, Dr. Dennis Carroll, he's had um, over 30 years of leadership experience in global health and development. And until recently, he served as the USAID, um, as director of the USAID Emerging Threats Division. Um, and in this position, um, he was responsible for providing strategic and operational leadership for the agency's program and addressing new and emerging disease threats. Um, today, he, so, so yes, yeah, sorry, he, he provided overall strategic leadership for the agency's response, response to the West Africa Ebola epidemic. 
Today, he currently heads the Global Rome Project, which is an international partnership to build the systems and capacities to detect and characterize future viral threats while they're still circulating in wildlife, enabling the world to better prepare before they spill over into us. And he was one of those people who has been extremely vocal about the, the possibility of a pandemic, um, similar to what we are um, seeing today. So um, now I will let the, um, let the interview start and you can hear from Dr. Dennis yourself. Okay, so Dennis, please can you tell us a bit about yourself and the Global Rome project and, and how you became interested in One Health? Well, my story uh, in terms of, of One Health, uh, it goes back about 15 years. Uh, when I became involved, I led our uh, U.S. Agency for International Development's response to the avian influenza uh, outbreaks of 2005. Right? Avian influenza turned my world upside down in a very positive way um, because I began to understand through avian influenza that the challenges for the challenge of meeting a threat like avian influenza, it wasn't something you could do simply working through um, the Ministry of Health and health clinics. That in fact, the complex dynamics involving how a virus um, that initiated its journey from wild waterfowl into domestic uh, livestock, uh, ducks, uh, chickens, and ultimately made its way to people. It really... I think, Michael, I think there's a problem with the sound. I wanted to protect the health of people. I couldn't wait for that very first person to get infected because it was clear the rate at which a highly contagious... I think we're having some problem with the sound here. For the challenge of meeting a threat like okay, other people can hear fine. it wasn't something you I could do hear. simply working through um, the Ministry of Health and health clinics. That, in fact, the complex dynamics involving how a virus um, that initiated its journey from wild waterfowl into domestic uh, livestock, uh, ducks, uh, chickens, and ultimately made its way to people. It really said something to me, which was if I really wanted to protect the health of people, I couldn't wait for that very first person to get infected because it was clear the rate at which a highly contagious version of avian influenza would spread through a human population, it would outpace our ability to develop a vaccine, to develop pharmaceuticals. And if we were really smart, what we really had to do was to reach um, further upstream back in to its native home. That is back into the animal population. And so the avian influenza made me understand that the chapeau for public health was much broader and much more inclusive, uh, reached beyond the Ministry of Health and Human Health issues. It really required that we had to partner with the livestock community, the wildlife community, and um, even more importantly, uh, the environmental community. It's that combustible interactive dynamic that brings wildlife and livestock and people together. Um, and it's really related to the disruptive effects we're having on the ecosystem that allows that um, dynamic interaction to occur. That it, it said to me that if we were going to be successful, we had to reimagine our whole notion of uh, what a effective public health response needed to be like. One health which was really the emerging paradigm that really said we had to tear down the barriers between the public health community, 
the animal health community and the eco health community. We really had to be smart and we had to move with the kind of um, uh, resilience and elasticity that viruses move through. They don't pay attention to these artificial barriers. And we've managed to construct silos and barriers in ways that allows viruses, bacteria to exploit them to the max. So smart way forward, One Health, bringing together the communities of these very important um, sectors. It's, it's a mutual beneficial relationship after all is said and done. We get it right for viruses, we'll get it right for the ecosystem, we'll get it right for animal health, and we'll get it right for human health. Oh, yeah, really, really important messages, I think, for the audience here at, uh, at the Global Landscapes Forum and to, to start thinking beyond just landscapes and, and how land, landscapes connect with, uh, with humans and, uh, and livestock and the health, health of all of these. Yes. So can you, can you then, because that's so important for the audience here, could you explain a little bit more why you think it's important, um, particularly from a landscapes thinking point of view? You know, how, how can we get uh, the landscape uh, supporters and thinkers here at the Global Landscapes Forum to start thinking you know, about these connections and, and how to move forward in, in promoting these connections. Yeah, absolutely. Look, one of the biggest challenges we had, if we were going to, um, in effect, move from reacting to future viral threats to being proactive, to go to the virus before it came to us, we had to understand why it is viruses circulating in wildlife what, what triggered them? What were the underlying drivers that propelled a virus that had been for eons circulating in isolation in a wildlife community to make its way to spill over into the human community? And we began doing some deep analytic work to try and understand what were those drivers. And what we found was that the single biggest predictor of where we could find the risk of spillover greatest was where we saw land use change most significant, which meant that as we moved our settlements, we moved our agricultural footprints proximal to these wildlife species. Ultimately, it was the wildlife species that had the greatest ability to cohabitate with human populations and our livestock. And those populations really were the risky, um, wildlife species that uh, elevated the probability of a spillover event. Mm -hmm. And so as we began abutting our farms against um, forests and jungle domains, we found that bats, rodents, even non-human primates, all carriers of novel potential viral threats to us, they learned how to live with us and we find time after time after time that the jumping of a virus from a wildlife animal into us is closely associated with these wildlife populations that have learned to live with us. And it's really that disruptive interaction, landscape disruption. So we, we have these, these issues, we have these problems. Um, what do you think needs to be done globally then to try and reverse these negative trends of, of land use change that are that is such a trigger for uh, for well for pandemics and and also for other crises as well? Well, really, the very first step is that the professional community, the public health professionals the veterinarians, uh, wildlife and conservation specialists, the ecosystem specialists. We have to tear down the barriers between us. These silos that we've built around our professions are the greatest impediment to our being able to really uh, better manage the risks and better manage the shared impact that we're having uh, on this planet. We need to begin developing a comprehensive um, whole of community, if you will, approach 
that allows us to bring public health professionals, veterinarians, wildlife specialists, conservationists, uh, landscape professionals into a shared understanding that if we don't better, one, manage the our footprint on this planet, and by footprint, I mean how disruptive we are on land use, how disruptive we are on the ecosystems, then all of the associated problems that we're seeing with emerging viral diseases, climate change, all of these are issues um, that are really putting our entire, not just planet, our species at risk. So if we want to have an impact, first, we have to begin forging a much stronger shared community approach um, towards you know, addressing these future challenges. Because quite frankly, as we move further into the 21st century, um, more and more people, we're going to have close to 12 billion people by the end of this century, which means if we are not more thoughtful, our footprint is going to continue to impact this planet that leaves us vulnerable to all of these related threats, new viral diseases, um, extreme weather events that uh, really put us at risk. So if we want to have a global impact, we need to begin organizing our local efforts in a way that make us one community that is committed to the health of the planet and by extension, we will find healthy humans, healthy ecosystems, healthy animals. It's, um, I mean, I, it's, I, I, I completely get what you're saying, but if, you know, if I think back to how the, this current COVID-19 pandemic um, has been responded to globally, you know, we see such huge gaps in the global response. I mean, even, you know, sitting here in Rome and looking at the response of the European Union, it hasn't been, we haven't even been able to be coordinated um, within Europe. And, uh, you know, I, I just wonder what, what can we as, as scientists or as landscape supporters or as community members, you know, what, what can we do to, to really help, you know, strengthen what really does need to be a global response in the future? Right. Look, um, I think, Many of us in this field understood that uh, the issue of a new viral threat, major global epidemic or pandemic, it was not a question of if, it was always a question of when. So the emergence of the COVID-19 uh, virus, no surprise. It did not um, sort of, I think, surprise any of us that it emerged as it did. What did shock me, and I think many of my colleagues, was the absolute failure of the global community to come together as a global community to respond to what is a global threat, not just to health, it's a global threat to our economies and our social well being. Uh, and it's that absolute failure of the global community to act as a global community that's really most shocking. And I don't think we can divorce. Um, that failure of response to what in fact has been a very disturbing trend over the last five years, the rise of nationalism, populism, really has fragmented the um, global networks and the global partnerships that had been the backbone of much of the work that we had done in previous decades. Uh, from the global health community, when we look at how we responded to the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, um, how we looked at how we responded to the 2009 H1N1 pandemic or even avian influenza. It was a global response yeah. that brought together multiple sectors, multiple communities, multiple governments, multiple interests. So we've, we've seen that we can do it. So I think first and foremost, we need to um, remind ourselves that working as a global community is something that we've demonstrated the ability to do in the past. And we need to recommit ourselves uh, to re-forging um, those alliances so that when we are faced with the next threat, and there will be a next threat sooner than later, we need to use this COVID-19 pandemic as a teaching moment. We need to understand 
the failures that we've had and understand what we need to do. And at the core of that is global leadership and global partnership. But with that said, I also want to say, even in the failure of the political community being able to come together, we have seen the scientific community act as a global uh, community. We've seen their ability to share data, to the ability to um, rush forward in ways that are historic with the development of vaccines for this virus. Now, it's still maybe the vaccines that are developed will or won't be effective. That's still a story to be told. But the process of developing those vaccines has been probably one of the most extraordinary global scientific ventures in the last several decades. Um, and it reflects the kind of open and not perfectly transparent, but certainly the way the scientific community, it's provided a, an example for what the global community needs to do. So I would say to the scientists in the audience today, you have led by example. Let's make sure our politicians learn from us and let's remind ourselves, we do have examples of how we can work together. Let's you know, recommit ourselves and bring our political brothers and sisters into the shared space that our scientific brothers and sisters have been able to execute so well. Lead by example, we can do it. Let me just end by quoting yeah. Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, um, you know, reminded us that uh, we can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. It's the definition of madness. We collectively, the scientific community as leaders, need to remind the world we have to bring a new vision, um, a new understanding to the problems around us. <laughs> we need to be challenged by what Albert Einstein said. If we're going to solve the problems of the world, we need a new way of thinking, a new way of partnering, and a new way of understanding our place on this planet. And we need to use that understanding to forge a new alliance. So I wish I were able to participate directly uh, in this meeting. I look forward to a future when uh, this forum will allow us to meet face to face. It's a place of great work and I'm a major enthusiast for how we can use the energy of a forum like this uh, to make the world a better place. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Well, I, I think those are excellent messages for, for us to take forward um, over the next couple of days in the Global Landscapes Forum. Uh, you've, you've uh, given us a, a, a strong role here as scientists and, and conservationists and environmentalists to play. And I, I think most importantly, to find ways to build these alliances. Thank you so much, Dennis. Thank you. Great. Great. Well, I hope you've all enjoyed that. Um, we will um, be putting that film um, online and we'll make sure that we share a blog through the Global Landscapes Forum with the link, um, as I'm sure you'd like to watch it again. I've watched it a few times and I uh, love it. It's fascinating and lots of great messages to all of us there. So um, now moving on, we're going to um, move on to our panel, uh, bringing some voices from the field um, and looking at how One Health has been and can be integrated into um, a landscape thinking landscape approach. So we have three presentations for you. Um, the first presentation is from my colleague, um, Dr. Bernard Bett, who's a veterinarian with a postgraduate training on epidemiology, uh, co-leading research on emerging infectious diseases at ILRI. Since May, um, Bernard has been leading the development of ILRI's One Health strategy and establishing the One Health Center for Africa. 
Um, his current research focuses very much on the impacts of climate, land use, and biodiversity changes on the occurrence and transmission of infectious diseases. So very much related to you know, what Dennis was just, uh, just talking about. Um, and he works with different actors in the public and private sectors and the development of decision support tools for managing disease risks based on information generated from research. So over to you, Bernard, um, if you could actually give the title of your presentation and uh, I leave it to you to continue. Uh, thanks a lot, um, Fiona, for that introduction. So the presentation actually is a video clip. Um, we, it's titled One Health, Wildlife, Livestock and Human Health in the Mara Serengeti Ecosystem. So what we want to do is to invite you to watch a short video which demonstrates how the Maasai pastoralists in East Africa, basically, I don't know, maybe most of you already know the Maasai Mara Serengeti ecosystem, which is a world renowned biodiversity hotspots, which also has many things like, you know, the wild wildebeest migration corridor. So in this clip, you will see how the Maasai pastoralists are using the ecosystem for their livelihood activities and in the process, getting exposed to multiple diseases, which then at the end of the video, we are pro pro proposing a use of a one health approach to manage um, uh, these diseases. So over to you, Michael, to share the video. Asai, kwa na msugu mingi, jina yake inaenda juu na chambulika kwa community. Kwa hivyo ni muhimu sana kuwa na msugu. Kulingana na culture, sisi ni wafugaji. Tunafuga kondo, ngombe, mbuzi. Kuna mapato tunapata kwa wanyama, kama nyama, damu na masiwa. Malisho kitambo ilikuwa tofauti. Tulikuwa tunapeleka ngombe ata kilomita 20, 30 ama 40. Na unatembea kila mali unataka. Sasa saizi imebadilika conservancy zimeanziwa pia siko restricted wa ngomba hizi ingia mimi hapa nafanya biashara nafanya bidwork lakini nafanya generally kama shop nauza vitu kama snacks sodas lakini kwa hiyo mchanganyiko nafuga mbuzi ngombe kondo niko na chache kiazi yenye inanisaidia unaweza ndisha kwa shamba yako hata ingawaje shamba ni kidogo sasa inabidi tena mpaka upeleke kule park kwa sababu ndio kuna uwanja kubwa ili waende wa changanyane huko na wanyama wa kule nyasi kwa sababu huko kuna nyasi ya kutosha changamoto zenye tunapata sana sana tukichanganya wanyama wa porini na mifugo wanaenda sometimes wana wanapata magonjo inabidi tena lazima ukuje uwatibu lakini lazima tu wachanganyike kwa sababu kule ndio kuna nyasi ya kutosha The Maasai Mara situation in Kenya is a classic example of what happens when landscape policies are developed without a one health approach This is because one health supports integrated management of landscapes that enhance sustainable coexistence of agriculture and wildlife Many experts such as ecologists vets public health professionals and others need to be involved in government and private sector decision making and planning processes. Si tu tu utria cases kama mbili simba imekuwa mbuzi. Sana sana sasa zile kuna mvua tuko na shida ya fizi zinaingia kwa boma ndio wanaanza kuwaua nini. Ina happen tu kama mara mbili. Kuzuia wanyama aziue wanyama zetu karibu kila familia iko na umbo wao. Sasa wakinuza wanaanza kubaka sasa ndio zi tunatoka kwa manyumba ndio tusunguke tuone ama tuanze tufuza wanyama juzi ama last year kulikuwa na hii shida hizi wanyama wa pori kulingana vile hiyo mbwa zimeumwa inaanza kupata kichaa sasa kwa boma hata inaweza tembea ilileta shida sana hata mpaka inauma watoto kuna hata watu wazima iliuma ilikuwa na shida sana rebis ni trade kwa community ya Maasai Mara so tu, nikipata nikiwa ground hiyo case na report immediately kwa ofisi ni hiyo area inatokezea tunapatsinate hizo mbwa zenye ziko huko 
na umbwa akiwa na rabies akiuma binadamu ina inashikwa na hiyo ugonjwa na ni risk sana mpaka sasa uende utibie ukiwa mtu na watu wa health tena akiwa akiuma tena ngombe inashukwa na hiyo na hiyo ugonjwa wild beast migrations na kujanga wakikuja kuna ugonjwa mwingine inaitwa malignant cattle fever which is MCF wakisa ngombe zikikula hizo nini inashukwa na hiyo ugonjwa yenye inaitwa malignant cattle fever na hiyo tunasemanga ina dawa no cure The choices we make about ecosystems have important consequences, sometimes unintended ones on human and animal health. A one health approach helps reduce further destruction and fragmentation of wildlife habitats, incorporating biodiversity values, while at the same time considering the health and nutrition needs of people. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Michael. Over to you. All right, over back to me, actually. So um, thanks, Bernard. That was great. Um, so now we will move um, to our second presentation, uh, which is from Fernanda Thomas da Rocha, uh, who's uh, IFAD Senior Regional Technical Specialist in Rural Institutions for the Latin America and the Caribbean region based in Lima. Um, before joining IFAD, she was senior manager at the Brazilian Development Bank. Uh, she joined IFAD last year and has been working in the Latin America country programs, uh, strengthening, strengthening farmers organizations and rural institutions, rural extension and advisory services there. Um, she's had a strong focus on agroecology and um, she's going to provide a presentation to us on the experiences um, of uh, in IFAD supported projects in Brazil, uh, incorporating agroecology um, into that. So over to you, Fernanda. Thank you, Fiona. Um, I will speak about uh, agroecology experience in Brazil that relates to the discussion we are having today of One Health approach. Um, let me share my screen one second. Okay, so I will present a project funded by IFAD in Brazil in Bahia called Pro Semi Air Project. So, uh, this is an ongoing project that currently uh, benefits about 62,000 families in, in, in Bahia, uh, in Northeast Brazil. Bahia is one of the poorest states of Brazil. Uh, it's located in the Caatinga biome, which is a tropical dryland zone characterized by a semi-arid climate uh, with recurrent uh, droughts. Uh, and also this is one of the most affected area of climate change impacts in Brazil. Uh, the project aimed to contribute to rural poverty reduction through agricultural production and development of human and social capital with a special focus on traditional peoples, women and youth. Uh, the project adopts an agroecology approach at both the farm and landscape levels. So um, it works with agroecological practices that uh, maintain a high level of diversity and integration of crops and animals in a farm systems that also conserve soil and water resource. And also at the same time, it can contribute to the conservation of biodiversity to reverse the land degradation process of Katinga and to increase food security and nutrition security. Um, I will then show some examples of how this is working on the ground. Um, so one of the, the priority groups of the project are a traditional com a former community from the Mier region of Brazil called Fundo de Pasto community in Portuguese, which is a traditional form of social organization based on communal land for extensive grazing systems for small animals, mainly goats, and combined with um, family crop growing systems. So in Bahia only, we have more than 500 communities and, and 20,000 rural families under the systems. 
So um, based on the premise that uh, the sustainability of the livelihoods of those communities depends on the, on the ecosystem service of the Katinga, the project um, used an approach uh, to recover degraded areas and to restore and conserve biodiversity in, in the Katinga. It's called uh, Recatingamento, which is a uh, Portuguese neologism for uh, Katinga reforestation. And it, uh, it does it through uh, participatory development of uh, a management plan, um, both for community herd and also for the sustainable use of the Katinga, while also uh, supporting general security of communities. Um, so um, the project uh, adopts an, an, a sustainable animal hus husbandry uh, strategy mainly for goats uh, breeding, as I said. And this strategy includes uh, rangeland management, capacity building, livestock infrastructure, uh, risk management, uh, institutions building, and also animal health. Um, especially in dryland systems, um, animal health is mostly linked to good nutrition. And to this end, the, the having a healthy environment is key. So then uh, working through this sustainable management of the Katinga, um, the project helped communities to increase further production, to improve animal health and also genetics, and while creating resilience and resilience of families. So just to give you some examples of strategies uh, used in the project, uh, such as the introduction of live fans and trees uh, that play uh, several functions, such as grazing control, um, shade and shelter for the animals, production of fodder, uh, and also human food production and other products such as firewood, honey. Also, there are some native tree species from Katinga that are very key for nutrition of animals, and especially in the dry season. Uh, in terms of agricultural production, the main strategy of the project is to work with agroecological backyard gardens. So these home gardens um, are part of the traditional campesino uh, peasant systems uh, in same year to Brazil. Uh, the project then helps families to adopt a resilient model of garden uh, where, uh, in which uh, there's a combination of a wide variety of food and fodder crops, and also if native and adapted trees and always using agroecological cultivation techniques. It also brings in the component of nutrition education. So in this um, uh, backyard area, also the project uh, introduced social technologies that are adapted to the Katinga biome and also improve human and environmental health. So for example, we have ecological stoves, we have rainwater harvesting systems for human consumption that improve nutrition through hygiene and are massively widespread in, in Brazil, semi-arid. Also water reuse systems for garden production that uh, recycle nutrients. So this strategy of agroecological gardens, they, they, they provide a source of uh, healthy, sustainable, nutritious foods, uh, which contributes um, to the health of the families and also to their livelihoods. So just, just for you to see, here is uh, the cistern. Here we have the water um, uh, reuse systems, backyard gardens, and also strategies for value addition and commercialization. Um, so the, the backyard gardens are mainly uh, managed by women. So it's a very key strategy for, for women empowerment. Um, the, the project has introduced a methodology called agroecological logbooks, cadenetas agroecologicas in Portuguese, and it is a tool to render women's work visible. Uh, and also it's, it's attached, linked to a process uh, very important uh, for women empowerment where it supports uh, women networks where they can exchange their experience, they can confront gender and racial inequalities and forms of violence, and also this not only contribute to their uh, empowerment, but also to their mental health, uh, which is also linked to the role women play in the health of the family uh, through food and caring. Um, youth are another uh, uh, strategy group, uh, and uh, the project works with them mainly through rural schools, um, where youth are trained in the development of nurseries and agroforestry systems. Also through field days, um, they are sensitized on the process of degradation of the Katinga and the importance of preserving and restoring it. 
Also, youth are trained as rural community agents, which is a, a human um, um, capacity building process where youth are trained to be to um, to reinforce their leadership roles in the communities, and they also act as a, a connection between their communities, their territories, and the political, the public policy space. So finally, to wrap up, um, so the, the, as we saw, the project adopts this agro, uh, an agroecology approach, which is an holistic approach that works in the interactions between the environment, livestock, and humans. Um, and in this sense, it contributes to the to the one health approach. We were discussing, especially in the in the pandemic context, um, uh, it has brought health to the forefront, and, and we see that health has a very central role among all those dimensions. So just to finish some key success, of, success factors of the project uh, was first this, uh, its landscape uh, approach, also building up capacity through continuous technical assistance uh, to marginalized groups, um, also always fostering participatory process and co-creation of knowledge and innovations, and finally um, establishing partnerships and strengthening institutions. Well, thank you very much. Um, and back to you, Fiona, thank you. Great, thank you, Fernanda, for that. Um, also, I, I do encourage everyone um, to keep your questions flowing in. We will be sharing these with the uh, presenters um, throughout the session, and uh, we should be able to feed some answers back to you. Um, so please, please continue uh, sending your questions through. So um, we move on to our, our third case study. We've so, so far we've been in Africa, Latin America, and now we go to Central Asia. Um, here we will visit a, um, a project in Mongolia, the Green Gold Project, and the work that they're doing and supporting there with national pasture user groups. Um, this this project is uh, the national coordinator of this project is Dr. Enki Amgalan Zili. Thank you, sorry, I actually realized I actually don't even know how to, how to say your last name. So please say it properly if I've made a mistake. Um, oh. But Enki, Enki um, has been, uh, she obtained a BSc um, at the Mongolian National University of Agriculture. Uh, she's been working uh, with pastoralists uh, all her life. Um, <laughs> after, after working in Mongolia for some time, she undertook her PhD in Switzerland, and most recently has been supporting the uh, Swiss Gold Project um, in, in Mongolia, and you will see in the film a lot of the work that she has been doing there. So over to you, Enki. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, actually, you can call me Enki. So I, um, I've been working on this project for um, quite a long time, about uh, 14 years, and let me share you before the, I will be showing you a video, and before the video, I will um, uh, share a um, short uh, presentation about uh, um, uh, about the work that we have been promoting in Mongolia. I think, uh, is this one? Uh, can you see my presentation? Hello? No, we can't, NK. Okay. Uh, Okay. Maybe you can just speak to it. Uh, okay, this is the one that can you show it or shall I? You'd have to share it. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, I have actually done it. And, uh, okay, sorry, sorry, the presentation. And then this is my. Okay. Uh, is it on now? No. Uh, okay. I have been sharing it, it doesn't come out or just like this. Okay. Uh, okay, now, no? No, sorry, okay. maybe just speak to the presentation quickly. Oh, and, and uh, okay, the first of all that uh, here in Mongolia that we have a project we are promoting healthy rangelands, healthy livestock, healthy food and healthy Mongolians. The idea behind is that uh, in Mongolia that uh, the rangeland based livestock herding is the main source of food and uh, also uh, the main source of the, the it's a, the main ecosystem in Mongolia. So we are trying to link 
uh, the, the herding practices into the product development. Eventually, that customers also have um, this knowledge about how the products, how the animals are kept in the rangelands, if the rangelands are healthier, how the range, how the livestock uh, health is uh, is being taken care by herders as well as the local authorities and so on. And we have developed uh, we, we have developed so-called the collective standard for healthy rangelands, healthy livestock, and healthy food in healthy Mongolians. The innovative part of this project is that to use a digital technology so that the customers and also the government uh, can monitor if the, if the products uh, supplied to the customers and also uh, uh, are, are in, in produced in a healthy manner. So this code of practice we have been developing in cooperation with the Ministry of Food and Agriculture of Mongolia and also the National Federation of Pastures Groups. This is the biggest collective organization of herders. So based on this um, database that we have been creating, we have developed the, um, this responsible nomads three spirit system. And when I was listening to the previous speakers, I have also understood that how do how do you uh, how do you bridge uh, the production system to the customers to the heart of the people? Because most of the products that are consumed by uh, by, by especially in case of Mongolia, the milk and meat, and many of the disease that are uh, that are that animals are infected also could be transmitted to the. Uh, to the people through through the through the livestock products. So the idea behind this project is really to promote this um, sustainable and healthy product uh, for the customers. Um, I will now share with you the movie that we have prepared, but I don't know whether it is. Uh, I've I've already. Uh, I'll I'll share that again. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you because I have some problem with my screen here. Thank you. Erul Bilcher, Erul Mal, Erul Huns, Erul Mongot Hun. Bid Uturburin or Golden Ilchik Sete, Oktos, Amin Dim, Erdis Vetsing Hirsege, Olung, Mahar Hanga Jirsung, Olum Slate. Mongol Malin Mahane Channer, Bilcher to Rotogo Sorgmota Shot of Botta Vedic Torsion. Erul Sorok, Olum Turzuling or Mota, Bilcher to Dishing Malin Mach, Channer to Huns Tejet Voltogol. Donatson Lloyd, Sherilton Dixon Bichert Edition Made Mach, Huni B. Mahote Game Tech, Alden Durding, Ochim Uskik Soil Nuxlik Burdujuan. Sulin Jiludit, Mongolorne Bichering, Urzi Shimt, Onagon Ormul in Turzudu Church, Malt Edimj, Tejet Mota Ormolot, Wilnor, Turch or Holla. Notak with Chairman Harkat, Nogon Harkatuch, Urshim Chandrin Hoot Motche. Үүнтэй үйлдэл мал сургамаа байнгын шим тижлийн дутагдлыг орох, энэ нь мах болон бусад бүтээгдэхүүний чанар буурах эрсдэл үүсч байна. Бэлцэр бикимага хүрэлж байдаг. Аа, үйлдэл үйлдэлийн цагаад өгч байдаг. Одоо тийм зөвцөлт байхгүй. Чи өтг буудсан одоо хамгаалагдахгүй газрын хөрс идэгдээд баг зарим газар нь бол баг урахгүй байх гэдэг. Эрүүл бичээрийн үржил шимтэй үүс урамлаар тэжээгдсэн. Эсвэл талхагдсан бичээр шин муутай хүний эрүүл мэндийн сөрөг нөлөө үзүүлэх магадлалтай хог урамлаар хоолсон эсхийг тогтох боломжтой болж байна. Үүнд улс цаг өөр байгаль орчны хяналтын хүрээлэнгийн Монгол орны бичээрийн төлөв байдлын сэргэх чадвархын лавлгаа жил бүрийн ашиглалтын нөлөө үндэх газрын харилцаа геодезийн зураг зүйн газрын фотомониторингийн мэдээллийг ашиглан тогтох боломжтой болсон. Ингээд нэг яра байгуулад явах юм бол ер нь боломж юм шүү. Энэ гаднаас одоо холын өрөөс нь үзэж байгаа мал ч юм бол одоо хөрс төрж орж ирэл за эм миний чиний ихгүй ингээд маргаан зөрчил гараад ирлээ гэхдээ би урдаас нэг үзүүлж харуулчих нэг эрчлэгээтэй. Хадны нэг өрхийгээд авахгүй мэд чи хүн авахгүй мэд тий тэрга хамгаалж юм байгаа. Тэр хитэн мал тоо зөвцөлөө бэлчээрээ ингээд малаа чанар зөвлөд эсгээ байж ирэл болох юм байна гэж бодож юм би. Ер нь малчаас бидэнд одоо хамгийн нэн толгоомсаа асуудал болоод байсан. Одоо энэ жилэсчилд өсч байгаа малыг одоо зах зээл эргэлтэнд оруулах асуудал бол хамгийн чухал асуудал байсан. Шууд үйлдвэртэйгээ ингээд харилцдаг болсноос бол одоо малын тодлохоос тодорхой хэмжээнд буурах за малын тодлохоо буурснаар бас бэлчээртэй бас зөв нөлөө үзүүлэх. За ер нь цаашдаа бол ингээд бас Монголын мал ажих бас зөв голдрлогоо орох чихэн болов гэсэн ийм бодлоор бол мал ч юм ер нь оролцож байна. Аа малыг одоо ийм гэж ингэж 
засын шижүүлд энэ маш олон талын ачаалагтай нэгдүгээрт малыг ирүүл байлаа хоёр дахь энэ нь бас энэ хулган асуудлыг бас зогсоход их жохол ачаалагтай юм гэж бид нэр малчид ч гэсэн ярьж байгаа мал эмдгийн гэрчлэгээ бүхий амьд мал болон малын гаралтай бүтээх түүний тээвэрлэх явцад тухайн тээвэрлэлтийн талаар шалгалтын постууд урд чилэн мэдээлэгдсэн байх бөгөөд хяналт шалгалтын ажлаа төлөвлөгөөтэйгөр гүйсгэх боломжтой байна тээвэрлэгдэж ирсэн амьд мал болон малын гаралтай бүтээх түүнийг орон нутаг нийслэлийн байнгын шалгалтын цэгүүдээр шалгагдсан тохиолдолд бол махны үйлдвэр хүлээн авах боломжтой юм. Үйлдвэр дээрээ ирсэн даруй тээвэрлэгдэж ирсэн малыг тус үйлдвэрийн малын эмч RFID уншигч төхөөрөмжөөр тоолно. Хүлээн авсан малын тоо мал эмдгийн гэрчлэгээ дээрх тоотой таарснаар систем дээр хүлээн авсан гэдэг тэмдэглэгийг махны үйлдвэр хийнэ. Махны үйлдвэр төргөгдсөн мал 24 цагийн хугацаанд сойлгонд байх бөгөөд нядалгаан дорхын өмнө өөрийн дугаараар бүртгэгдэнэ. Нядалгааны хэсэгт дахин давтагдахгүй дугаарыг баркод хэлбэрээр хөвлөж мал бүрийн үйлдвэрийн бүх дамжлагаар дамжихд дагалдуулна. Эцэст нь хэрэглэгчийн гар дээр очих бүтээгт хүнд гарал үүсийн шошиг хадагдсанаар тус бүтээгт хүн гарал үүсэл эрүүл мэндийн баталгаатай хүнсний бүтээгт хүн болно. Гарал үүсэл эрүүл мэндийн баталгаатай хүнсний бүтээгт хүн нь Махмарт компани нэрийн барааны дэлгүүрээр туршилтын шугамаар амжилттай худалдаад гэдэв. Энэ үеэр тусгай аппликейшн ашиглан бүтээгт хүний гарал үүсийг шалгахад тун сонирхолтой байлаа. Энэ ажил олон талын аж холбогдолтой бөгөөд тухайлбал хүнсний аюулгүй байдлын баталгааг хангаж нийгмийн эрүүл мэндийг хамгаалах мал эмлэг цагда мэрэгчлийн хяналт махны үйлдвэрүүдийн хариуцлагын тогтолцоог тодорхой болгон хэрэгжүүлэх малын хөдөлгөөнийг хянаж халдвар төвчин тархах эрсдлийг бууруулах малын хулгайг талсан зогсох гэхмэд олон давуу талтай юм цаашлаад махны экспортод тавигддаг эхний шатны шаардлагуудыг Монгол улсад хэрэгжүүлэх боломжтой юм гэдгийг орчин үеийн дэвшилтийн технологи ашиглан туршиж чадлаа Okay, thank you. That's all from my side. And uh, now this uh, system is being upscaled with the support of uh, Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation and with the Ministry. So uh, the idea is really to link the rangeland health and animal health with the customer uh, with consumer public consumer food safety and also to make sure that uh, there is uh, the, the customers are provided with healthy products thank you thanks anki and uh, and again we we'll, we will make sure that we share links to all these films um and the presentations um as we uh, uh through a blog um in the next uh, week or so So uh again I encourage everyone please put your questions uh either on yeah in, in Wova um and we will feed these through to the participant to the panelists and uh hopefully you will get some questions answered today. Um so moving moving on we move on to the the main last section of our of our uh, session uh which is a policy, uh, policy panel and I hand over to my colleague Michael Victor um So Michael over to you. We can't hear you Michael. Yeah, no, there we go. Uh thanks a lot uh, Fiona that's great. I mean it was amazing to see those cases. I think we went all over the world from uh Brazil to Kenya and then all the way over to Mongolia so I think we've we've covered everything. Uh so welcome to the pan policy panel. I think you know it was we had a lot of rich kind of presentations and I think one of the things that really struck me was from Dennis when he said we have to be proactive if we're going to do one health. I think one of the things that we really want to get out of this policy panel is really to see how do we really do integrate one health into landscape approaches? What are some of the policy, institutional and investment uh implications for this and how do we really go to scale? So with that introduction I'd like to introduce our great panel really quickly. Uh we have uh Doreen Robinson, 
who is the Chief for Wildlife uh, at the UN uh, Environment Program. Uh, Doreen is from the US. She has a, is a conservation uh, ecologist with uh, 25 years of experience. She's a real system thinker and has a passion and desire to connect people to find solutions to you know, really solve some of these really complex problems, both in the environment and development. She's worked with WWF and USAID, and we're really happy at ILRI that she's joined as the advisory member to the uh, One Health Center, and UNEP and ILRI have just signed a memo, uh, memorandum of understanding, which is great too. Uh, so welcome, Doreen. Uh, I'd also like to uh, invite uh, Martina uh, to join us. Uh, Martina Fleckenstein is the Global Policy Manager for Food and Practice at WWF. Uh, she has been with WWF for 27 years, dealing with conservation, agriculture, and sustainable production at the national and international levels. She's been responsible for projects on sustainable land use management and planning, including sustainable forest and agriculture production, and initiated projects on sustainable consumption in Southeast Asia, uh, Africa, and Latin America. Uh, welcome, uh, Martina. Ah, there you are, great. Uh, and uh, the next person is uh, Dr. Uh, Phuc Pham Duc uh, from uh, Vietnam. He is the coordinator of the Vietnam One Health University Network. He's also deputy director of the Center for Public Health and Ecosystem Research, uh, Health and Sustainable Development. Uh, and he's worked extensively on One Health approach combating, uh, combating antimicrobial resistance and controlling zoonotic disease in Vietnam. Uh, he's one of the key players to really spread and institutionalize the One Health approach from what I've heard. So welcome on board, uh, Dr. Phuc. Uh, and uh, you can unmute yourself too. Uh, let's see if we can. Okay, great. Uh, and then I'd like to finally add uh, Dr. Uh, 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 to add uh, Bernard Bett, my colleague again at ILRI. I think he's already been introduced. Uh, and just to add that he is the manager for this new One Health Center for Sub-Saharan Africa that's based at ORI and is really working uh, to move the One Health approaches and support national level approaches. So we have a great panel on board. And the first question, I'd really like to get back to the case studies and to what Dennis has said. And really just a quick observation from everybody on what are some of the real policy implications from your own experience of these case studies for you? So maybe Doreen, could we quickly hear from you? Sure, um, so, so what I loved about the case studies was that it also highlighted One Health isn't just zoonotic diseases. These issues of food security, nutrition are all part of One Health approaches. Um, but I think all the case studies highlighted the fact that we need to do more at bringing up the expertise on the environment dimensions of One Health approaches. Um, and we need to incentivize that in our policies. That means beyond going beyond veterinary policies and interventions, but really at looking at uh, policies that incentivize engaging at the root cause, at the ecological dimensions level, um, and, and what's really driving these public health emergencies. So we've talked about habitat degradation and loss or some areas. I think um, the other thing that the case studies highlight is that there are many enabling uh, instruments out there and mechanisms to work, but I think Dennis said this much, but they're not working together. So um, I know sometimes the reaction is to have, create, let's create a new policy, but I think of good starting places, we've got to look across these existing policies that are indeed siloed and figure out ways that they can work together better. And then there may be some policy gaps that we need to invest in and fill in. Um, and then the last point I'll make about the case studies is how important with One Health approaches. Um, we have to invest at the international collaboration level, but it's so important to make sure the enabling environment policies are right at the national level. Um, because with these kinds of threats, um, uh, public health threats, it's very hard. If you have a weak link at a, a national level, it can very quickly become a, a, a regional or a global issue. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Phuc, from you, uh, Vietnam, how did these experiences relate to your own very quickly? Okay, thank you very much for giving my chance to sharing my experience. So actually in Vietnam, so is it for the case that it is in before, I think very important, one health approach. So for me, that uh, it, uh, one health is uh, every, everyone working together. So different sectors, 
different level from community to global level to must be to sharing experience and the impact together. But I think very important thing that should be changed the mindset is the leadership. So it's a leadership uh, people, if they have changed the mindset, it could be a good way for us to bring different sector working together. For example, in Vietnam, it's a COVID-19. You know that we are very well controlled at the moment because the government, they are very high commitment and the very uh, state, uh, very it's early, it's a state of uh, pandemic. So they involve different scientific and non-scientific, even the local authority, they are working together. So I think that's very, very important to change the mindset to bring it a multi sector collaboration. And I think that one other very important for, for us, we need to prepare in the future pandemic. This means it's a one hand move forward. Uh, development is a, the key thing to change the mindset, the early step for students. Also, it's a current start working at different level, even in the center of the community. Yeah, that I think I learned some from my spirit of case study. Thank you very much. Excellent. That's great. Really interesting about the mindset. I don't think that that's been mentioned before. Uh, Martina, how about, how about yourself? Any, any thoughts on the case studies? Yes, uh, my main takeaways uh, from these case studies, uh, the one is what we need is an integrated landscape approach. It's uh, the stop of land use change and it's get out of the silos. And I think let's elaborate a little bit more on that. Uh, one of the biggest challenges in context with landscape approaches we are facing at the moment is the stop of deforestation and land conversion. And this is mainly caused by unsustainable food production, crop production for food, for fiber, for fuel. And this exactly um, uh, leads to this conflict of humans, wildlife and environment. And the thing is, if deforestation and land conversion will continue to raise, and that's still the situation, the risk of pandemic and sonic diseases will increase. And what we need, and I want to emphasize, is we need a transformation of our food system the way how we produce and where we produce. And at the other end, the examples which have been presented are really encouraging. They're showing innovative ways to engage local communities, sustainable management of their land, but what they also show that there will be no single solution. What we need is uh, an integrated solution that safeguard forests, safeguard um, natural habitats, shift to nature positive production, and providing healthy food. And just to highlight, I like very much uh, the example from Brazil on these agricultural backyard gardens, which I think could, should be made to a global movement. And this is a super important and very encouraging project, by the way. Thank you. I mean, in, and even in the, the West and in urban areas, we should all have a, a backyard garden, not just in rural areas too. I think that's, that's something that's important. Uh, Bernard, just kind of looking at some of the other uh, the other cases as well. But how you know how can One Health really be institutionalized at the national level? I mean, Kenya has done a great job, or at the local level. How is that working, and how are you doing that really uh, practically? Yeah, thanks, uh, Michael. Yeah, many countries, actually, not just Kenya, have been institutionalizing One Health. So they started about ten years ago when they started bringing together. Uh, um, public health, animal health sectors to work together. But we still see a number of weaknesses in these institutions that you know they need to be expanded to include um, um, environment. In, in very few cases, I think I've seen a few countries like Uganda, maybe some places like Ethiopia, where there's that intention to include environment. But I think in many places, um, yeah, they should be expanded. One other thing which comes to mind from the um, case studies which we just saw is there's also a heavy influence or interests on nutrition. And so, and that's something which is hidden. It doesn't really come out very, very clearly like a disease which really affects huge population. But you know, when you have mal malnutrition which runs for many, many years, then I think it also should be um, um, considered as a strong um, uh, gap in terms of you know making things work in, in an in a landscape. 
Excellent, thank you. Uh, you know, we've had some questions from the floor and if everyone can, if they have questions, please feed them to Murray. We'll try to answer them on the chat as well as, you know, here on the, the panel. One question that came up uh, during the Menti, and I'd like to put that to Dr. Uh, Fook, is about wet markets. And, you know, there's been a big controversy about banning wet markets or not. How does that, how do you, what, what's your perception of that? Should we ban wet, wet markets or not? And how does the One Health approach really kind of address the, the wet market issue or the informal market issue? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this question. Very interesting. I see that actually in Vietnam, the wet markets are very popular. Uh, I see that more than 80% of the people, they prefer to buy the food in the wet markets because it's a very convenient, available. Even my family, is my wife, she normally bought the pork meat in very close to my house, where there's the wet markets. Because they believe that this uh, food is very fat and it's not convenient to sit in time. They don't want to prefer go to the supermarket to take time. And so they not believe that this the quality of food in the uh, supermarket uh, is well controlled or not because it's a different uh, supply chain uh, to the supermarket. Actually, it's uh, for our research conducted. We, we found it very high. Uh, it's a prevalent salmonella contamination in the pork meat, even in the supermarket and the wet market. Even in the wet market, maybe a little bit lower compared in the supermarket. So what's the reason? Maybe it's a uh, crop contamination during the transport and the processing, and it's not really it's a hygiene practice, for example. Of course, so in Vietnam, also it's a wet market and they sell it different thing. It's not only the domestic animal, also the wild animal. So it's the one way of transmission, the pathogen between the wild animal to the domestic animal. Also, it's a very crowded people come there to buy and sell interaction. It's a very close. So I see that it's a one, it's a transmission route, very, very important in, in Vietnam. So I see that that's why how we can manage them. But I think it's very important. It's a policy, it's a local government, they are need to have a strong it's a power as a people, the enforcement to follow the regulation. And I think that's very important. It's a one health approach, it's a good way to encourage everyone need working together. So that I'm thinking it's very, very important for, for it also link very much with uh, how it's a uh, land uh, chain you like the livestock production increasing because of population increasing. So that uh, they need to change and to raising a lot of different uh, livestock, different type of livestock, even in the area of people living. So very crowded to continue and people have exposed between uh, the environment, animal, uh, domestic animal and the wild animal and the people. Yeah, it's the same area. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, just quickly, I heard saw Doreen's hand or pencil up, and uh, so do you want to respond to the wet markets? But also, I'd like to kind of get back to this idea of you talking about some of the barriers and constraints. Again, it's not just about developing new policies, but you know, how do we break through and actually implementing new policies or get private sector on board? Uh, what can be done? And you have to unmute. Um, I did want to add something on the wet markets, I think it's really important that we have risk appropriate policies. So cleaning up the regulation and improving hygiene along entire food value chains, um, whether it be domesticated animals or wild animals involved is definitely needed. But um, there is evidence that uh, widespread bans alone uh, do not always work and they can drive uh, people's need for consumption for protein underground, which makes it even more risky. Um, because there is no regulation. So we have to look at that. And there is evidence from um, West Africa during the Ebola outbreak where when, uh, when food markets were banned um, uh, in particular, it didn't work um, and it actually didn't reduce the health risk. So again, systems analysis and taking risk appropriate policy interventions here. It doesn't mean that doesn't mean prohibitions don't sometimes work in limited matters, but it's gotta be part of a holistic response. Um, and, and based on evidence. So then pivoting to some of the barriers, um, it's not really a very eloquent pivot, but uh, pivoting to some, of the, to some of the barriers. I mean, I think one of the most important things is um, first of all, understanding how we break down and find a common language to work together to break down these silos. 
Um, I think risks, everybody understands risks, they perceive risks, they put is a great way to start to bring worlds together in terms of, for example, in the private sector, um, if you look at your supply chain, what are your risk factors? What are your representational? What are your material risks um, to, to, to your actual markets? I'm so excited, I'm losing my microphone. Um, and so I think that finding a common language and understanding that is really important. I think the other point I wanna emphasize is that you know, public environment and animal health is everybody's concern. It isn't just a government concern. Um, it's an individual's concern, COVID has shot us that. But um, it is also a concern for all of society. NGOs have a role to play, private sector has a role to play. Um, and we have to understand how do we bring them in in those different expertise in an appropriate way into these One Health processes. Um, and so that we can start to actually bridge those gaps. And the last point I'll make is barriers is no one is asking every sector to be an expert in everything, right? It's about bringing those different sectors and expertise together in appropriate ways um, so that policy responses and, and educational campaigns can actually approach these issues in a more holistic manner. Excellent. Martina, yeah, I'd like to bring you in, particularly about the food systems. We've heard, you know, Dr. Fook was also talking about this, you know, that it's the land use change, that we have animals being closed up, we're having, you know, animals close to urban areas. How, what kind of transformations, like you were discussing before, do we need at the food systems? And what role maybe does this, you know, the United Food Systems Summit play and some other big international uh, processes play? Yeah, I, I also want to step in and a little bit also follow up what Bernard was saying, uh, telling about the nutritious food. Yeah. So I think what we need is really to rethink what we have every day on our plate. And if I have more nutritious food, if I have more biodiverse crops, more biodiverse food, this would also mean a change on the production on the ground. And this leads again to we, we don't have to talk any longer about agriculture consumption. It's about the food system transformation, what we need. And I think with the upcoming UN Food System Summit, which will happen at the end of next year, there is a unique opportunity really to integrate also this one health aspect in the overall discussion. We will have, um, there will be food system dialogues all over the places. So everybody could really get in, uh, raise his opinion uh, on this way. The other thing I, I would like to mention, and this is once again, this getting out of the silos. We will have three important UN convention conferences next year. It's a climate COP, the biodiversity COP, and it's the one from the UNCCG on desertification on land restoration and rehabilitation. And to combine this, and this is the challenge to everybody, uh, how we could manage and to bring this together with the food question we have on the transformation of food system. Um, this is where we have to go and the time is now to act. We have maybe 10, 12 months to work on this, but we should use this opportunity. And, and that's why I want to encourage everybody to participate active in ideas how to transform food system. We have a lot of knowledge, but the question is always how to scale up and how to implement in this landscape approaches. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, just really quickly with that, I mean, Doreen, just getting back to you really quickly, how can we use, you know, if we're talking at the international level, what do you think about using the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration in which UNEP plays a central role to raise awareness on One Health and build support for it? Like, what, what could we really do there? Yeah, so I think it's a, it's a great question. I, I totally endorse what uh, Martina said as well about the food system transformation and those roles. On the ecosystem, um, I mean, on our ecosystem restoration, look, we know land use change is a major driver of uh, risk for zoonotic disease, as well as other human health risks, including pollution, things like that for clean air and water. So um, yeah, absolutely getting behind the ecosystem um, on the decade of restoration in terms of building back these critical areas that are needed to maintain the full ecosystem functioning that are needed. And again, that's our link to landscapes approach, right? You don't just restore in a box um, separate. You have to look at where that restoration can happen. What are the different factors you're restoring for within a particular landscape to optimize multiple co-benefits? And those include 
one health co-benefits. They also include carbon sequestration benefits. They can include improving biodiverse food systems. Um, so we need to think about those restorations within this landscape approach as well. Okay, excellent. Uh, great. Uh, Bernard, just getting back to you really quickly, uh, you know, as we've mentioned that, you know, Ilri's just opened up this new One Health Center for Africa. How do you see it breaking down barriers and bringing, bringing in linkages? There's been some also talk, is there any talk about bringing in the private sector? How do you bring in the private sector to this? Yes, um, as you said, Michael, we, we now set up a One Health uh, here with support from Germany. But, uh, and one, one of the main things we want really to do is to enhance understanding One Health because you know, most people here, the levels of understanding are quite different and also the approaches or the, the really the, this drive to initiate One Health has been basically top down. So if we enhance that understanding, we hope there'll be shared um, agreement, shared understanding and, and people are willing to work together and even ministries and governments are willing to share resources so that you really have an organic um, way of building One Health institutions. Um, on the private sector, that's also another big area which we have a big interest on because thinking of, you know, food uh, vendors and industries, you really have to segment a market for them to, for the consumer to know that if you buy a product from a given vendor, it's more likely to be more safe or more nutritious. And so in a way you are inculcating this um, thing of um, um, uh, food uh, safety and hygiene standards. So, so in a way, actually you're using a risk-based approach to enhancing marketing of safe, nutritious food by given, um, uh, which meets some given standards. And lastly, maybe one thing which is really also very dear to us is, um, you know, this very limited evidence that actually if you use One Health, you are more likely to succeed. Yet, it, theoretically, it's known it's an it's a way of optimizing approaches to disease control. So what we want to do is work with partners from other places like Europe, uh, North America, and other places to really estimate what's that added benefit of combining efforts from multiple sectors. So in that way, you can actually demonstrate to a government that if you were to do this thing in a, in a more multi-sectoral approach, you are likely to save uh, this much but at the same time, increase your, your impact by this level. So those are the evidence which is really needed to drive a common understanding and common approach. And I think in the final analysis, then people are likely to, to work together to address those challenges. Okay, great. Uh, Martina, I, I saw that you wanted to mention something yeah, about the practice. Uh, yeah, just to add also once again to and build on what Bernard said, that we need safe and nutritious food. I think we need food and we, uh, we, well, we know that it's not coming from a previous uh, primary forest or a natural um, conversion of natural ecosystem. And that means we need more transparency in the supply chain. And I'm, I'm really always a little bit annoyed when I read that a lot of companies gave commitments to stop um, uh, deforestation and land conversion by 2020 we have still two months left and nothing is happening so I think we have to go away from just giving commitments uh, we have to go to actions and what we want to see is really companies implementing their commitments and also combine it with the one health aspect I think the time is now and we have to act okay excellent we're going to have to close it up right now but I'd like to kind of go around and just get kind of your opinion on one critical action uh, to integrate One Health into landscapes. And someone commented emphatically, I think I see, you know, how do we uh, look for ecosystem health in the One Health concept as well? So Dr. Fook, any quick kind of like, what's the one action that we need to really integrate uh, One Health into landscapes or ecosystems into One Health? Uh, please uh, unmute. Okay, you thank you very much for the very, very important the question. Yes, we not uh, forgot about the ecosystem always around us. And uh, for example, in Vietnam, we in Vietnam now we are facing it uh, very big storm and a flooding in the central uh, region. It uh, more than one hundred people died, and many many uh, uh, poultry and cow and buffalo died. It's a disaster uh, for the pollution environment. 
So that because the people, we uh, need the food and that we need choice uh, for that too. But now the storm and for uh, it uh, flooding coming, the people, they are affected a lot. So that uh, we need to change the mindset. As I mentioned that the leadership should be changed and so the future uh, workforce could be changed. So I think it's key, very important to, to bring the law lead and scheme uh, competency, how different sector people working together. So that uh, education and training at the university, very important point. So to make, we hope that is a future leader, they have changed their mindset and they have changed how they are working together. So that one is a key action from Earth, from now and to in the future. Thank you very much. Excellent, Dr. Brooke. I like that, you know, the mindset. That's a key message. Doreen, what about yourself? What's a key action that we need to take? I think we need to bring more ecologists, wildlife specialists, um, ecosystems um, experts into the One Health discussion. It has been overlooked to date, and we need to do more. Okay, great. And that's what we've been trying to do in this session as well, I think. Yeah. Really <laughs> uh, Bernard, what about yourself? What's one action that we're going to be able to take? I th I like the comment from Fook. I think um, because when you look at the tipping points, actually it's us, the communities, um, stretching beyond the limits of a given landscape. So if we can have that concerted effort, and I also, what Doreen says, you know, working with social scientists to encourage communities to understand, you know, that there's an, a limit at which you can, for example, let put, put animals in a given place, you know, I think that understanding needs to come out that beyond some given point, you actually start seeing many losses, not just on diseases, but even your own productivity. So Great. Thank you, Martina. Any final comment or any final uh, action? Yeah, just two sentences. Integrate agroecology in land use management and planning and stop land conversion. That's from my side. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I'm not going to uh, say anything else or wrap up. I'm going to hand it over to Fiona and we have a special guest to also give some final reflections as well. So I'd like to thank everybody and over to you, Fiona. Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, just to give a heads up, uh, we are producing a white paper alongside this panel. Um, it's still in draft and we would love your input into it. So Morel has um, shared that in the, the link in the chat. Um, Within that, actually, we also talk about the issue of ecosystem health. Um, my own take, which I will give now, um, is that people, livestock and environment are part of ecosystems. So it's like landscapes. We need to see how we can integrate One Health into that. Um, but anyway, we talk more about this in our white, pa white paper. Have a look. And now our special guest, over to John. Uh, John, we would like to know from you, John Colmey, uh, we would like to know from you what you think about this panel and our challenge to you is, which from the beginning, this inception, when we started talking about this panel was, you know, really, how do we bring One Health into the, the landscape uh, dialogue and uh, into the landscape approach? Fiona, thank you so much. This was perhaps the most important session of the conference. It was the speakers and I thank everyone just for great insights. It also reminds us that the landscape approach and One Health have been running in parallel for as much as 25 years. And I, I go back to, when I went back to research and thank you, Fiona, when you saw our concept note and you said, wait a minute, you're only talking about one part of One Health. You're not talking about human health. You're not talking about, so we went back and we rewrote the concept note. Now we're gonna hopefully bring a convergence to these two. But I go back to one very important land, uh, landmark Conference, One World, One Health, Building inter Interdisciplinary Bridges, September 29th, 204, New York City, Rockefeller University. If you read that, you wonder why weren't we listening? They came up with 12 Manhattan principles. We're going to put it in the side, and but no one was listening. If we had listened to that paper and those recommendations, and many of you have, might have gone to this conference, we could have avoided the COVID and other issues and the problems we've had with so many zoonotic diseases. But I am absolutely committed now and all of us at GLF to connect this, to bring health firmly into everything we do. You know, we talked about landscapes, as we've always talked about landscapes as prosperous, I mean, productive, prosperous, equitable, and resilient. And I'm gonna to propose to the charter members that we change this to, instead of resilient, healthy. 
We need to bring health into this discussion and we will do everything we can. And thank you so much for this. We are absolutely committed. And it's gonna, this could be, if we're lucky, the most important conference since that one in New York, if we manage to do that. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thanks, John. And I'm, I'm glad, um, I'm glad uh, the, the appreciation, appreciation of yourself and of the participants. We're getting a lot of good reports uh, on the session. Um, the conversation will not end here, of course. Um, there are lots of sessions continuing throughout the Global Landscapes Forum where these issues can be raised, so please do that. Um, please also um, do continue to ask questions. We will encourage all our panelists to go on to WOVA and to answer your questions there. Please do have a look at our white paper and, uh, and give comments on that. So um, great, thank you so much everybody for joining. We've had a fabulous um, group of participants here, fabulous, fabulous audience, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks.